December 11th, 1943. Mark Twain once said that courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. This week, Hitler continues to give in to his pathological fears that are the foundation of his entire political existence, while his victims master their fear time and time again to defy him and his hordes of miscreants. This week, Hitler takes another step towards defeat, and many ordinary single human beings choose the path to victory, resistance. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, the Allied leaders began planning for a post-war world. The Nazi puppet regime running occupied Italy announced that it will start deporting foreign and Italian Jewish people. In Yugoslavia, Tito proclaimed a provisional Yugoslav government amidst a renewed German offensive to finally obliterate the partisans in Bosnia. In Greece, the Germans went after disabled veterans opposing the German occupation. The United Nations alliance bombed Berlin and Leipzig. This week, it is an Axis power that once again bombs civilian targets, Japan. On December 5th, two waves of about 250 Japanese bombers from Burma descend on the docks and railway depots of Calcutta, the capital of Bengal, British India. Save for some outdated hurricane planes, the city is practically defenseless. As they pull away from the incredibly densely populated city, they leave behind hundreds of mangled bodies strewn across the bombed areas. The real death toll is never tallied. First of all, it's difficult to separate the dead by bombing from the many corpses of famine victims also scattered around the city. Second of all, the colonial administration considers the recently deceased a security risk, as they are proof that the Japanese can cause more than light damage in the city, which might reignite the panic of a pending Japanese invasion that seized the region earlier this year. The bodies are quickly removed and disposed of out of sight of the public. The local newspapers speak of slight damage and claims that the RAF heroically defended the city. The official death toll is set randomly at 335 and the local government urges everyone to return back to normal. While the bombing raid may have caused some slight delays in wartime transports, it's mainly the already famished Bengalis whose suffering is increased when food aid can't be delivered as fast in the coming weeks. Speaking of effect, or rather lack of effect of bombing campaigns on wartime production. This is a hot topic at German Führer Adolf Hitler's East Prussian hideaway this week. Now, the lack of effect should not be surprising from the United Nations viewpoint. The USAAF have suspended most of their daytime bombing against industrial targets after the terrible losses suffered against the Luftwaffe a few weeks ago. The RAF nighttime bombing doesn't even have that as a goal, or as head of Bomber Command Arthur Harris put it two months ago. The aim of the combined bomber offensive should be unambiguously stated as the destruction of German cities, the killing of German workers, and the disruption of civilized life throughout Germany, the destruction of houses, public utilities, transport, and lives, the creation of a refugee problem on an unprecedented scale, and the breakdown of morale both at home and at the battlefronts by fear of extended and intensified bombing are accepted and intended aims of our bombing policy. They are not byproducts of attempts to hit factories. Ambiguous therein might be the effect of killing workers, but the bombing raids, as lethal as they are, hardly make a dent on the workforce. I'll get back to that in a second. However, during the week when Hitler meets almost daily with Reichsminister für Bewaffnung und Munition Albert Speer and his deputy Karl Sauer, they do have urgent problems to discuss. While Speer is maintaining production levels, even slightly increasing them, the promised continued dramatic increase of production has failed to materialize, and what is being produced is not reaching the Eastern Front, which is also now suffering from a lack of manpower. The Nazis are facing a trifecta of issues here. One, logistics, always a problem, is increasingly so under sabotage and partisan railway interruption, so they can't get the parts and material they need distributed fast enough into the vastly spread out industry. What they do produce also doesn't arrive fast enough to the front. Two, raw materials. The plundering of occupied territories was already not yielding what they had hoped, and the occupied territories are now shrinking. 
with it vital access to all kinds of resources, from metal ore to oil. 3. Manpower The continued mobilization of German men of fighting age and capability can only happen at the cost of the workforce. Now, the latter is less of a problem for Speer than one might think. The massive conscription of millions of men and the tens of thousands of deaths in bombing raids has been largely compensated by close to 10 million slaves, body leads to industry and agriculture, as well as held in concentration, labor, and factory camps. But Hitler now wants Speer to give him German workers to fill 20 new divisions, more than 300,000 men. In a letter to the Gauleiters this week, Speer states that it will be difficult, but manageable. The raw materials problem is more complicated, and has led to Speer looking for a stopgap. The one he has found is a belief that in the parts manufacturing or subcontracting industry, there are hidden reserves that can be tapped. Thus, as this week begins, Hitler issues the Erlass zur Steigerung der Zulieferindustrie, which gives Speer virtually unlimited control of private industry across Germany to personally and immediately divert whatever raw materials, parts, and manufacturing capacity he needs for the war effort. Adolf and Albert's sense of urgency is, however, not driven by a need to better supply the armed forces. It's revenge and vanity projects that are at the top of the Führer and his architects' minds. On Thursday, Hitler takes great pleasure in watching a film about the progress of his new headquarters, Projekt Riese, Project Giant, to be built under several villages and structures centered around Castle Wolfsberg in Lower Silesia. Construction began in October on what is planned to be a huge underground system of living quarters, offices, and command centers, even factories. It's supposed to house the entire Nazi command structure from political to military with a total area of 194,232 square meters, 5,000 out of which are set aside for Hitler's personal headquarters. More than 20,000 slaves from the Großrosen concentration camp will work on the project. 5,000 of them will be murdered in the process. It will never get even close to completion. As for revenge, the two are troubled by the lack of progress in the Vergeltungswaffe program, the ballistic and cruise missiles that Hitler plans to rain down on the British Isles. Even Goebbels expresses astonishment in his diary this week over Speer's and Hitler's obsession with this strategically insignificant program and how their hatred for England is now standing in the way of properly equipping and manning the Eastern Front. Well, as Indy will tell you in his weekly episodes, the RAF and USAAF are going after the rocket launch sites under construction and trying to hit the production facilities in Operation Crossbow. The launch sites are easier targets than the production sites which have now moved into underground slave camps. Last week, Speer went to the main camp, Mittelbau Dora, and he was not happy with what he saw. Less troubling seems to have been the miserable, lethal conditions of his slaves while a lack of raw materials and parts did trouble him. But now he hopes that his new authority will give him access to just that, again at the expense of fixing the delivery problems to the Eastern Front. But the Eastern Front is not the only place that material is not arriving fast enough to the German forces. In Bosnia, where the Germans and their allies are pursuing Tito's partisans to finally encircle and obliterate them, it's 10 degrees below freezing and winter has arrived before winter equipment has reached the Germans and their allies. The soldiers are suffering from frostbite and exhaustion. The commander of the Prince Eugen division is so burnt out that he is granted leave. The German alliance still has a huge numerical advantage, though, and managed to continue their advance to encircle the three main partisan divisions engaged. It's not a tight cordon, though, and German signals intelligence lacks the means to determine the exact location of partisan units. By the end of the week, the Germans have not yet moved to obliterate the pocket. Inside, the three partisan divisions are probing the enemy lines independent from each other. As they do, they find the gaps in the cordon, and more and more units start slipping away. Further to the south, on the Peloponnese Peninsula, when Greek partisans slip away, the Wehrmacht takes out its wrath on the civilian population. The 117th Jäger Division is comprised mostly of middle-aged Austrian conscripts, not the usual volunteers for mass murder you'll find in the SS. They've been reassigned here from the Yugoslavian anti-partisan operations during which they committed the Kraljevo massacre in October 41. 
Their current mission is to pacify the Peloponnese, currently under de facto control of Greek partisans of the Iam and Elas movements. On October 17th, Elas ambushed and captured 81 German soldiers which were taken to the liberated town of Calavrita, where they are still being held. In return, the Germans took close to 4,000 civilian hostages from all over the Peloponnese as a bargaining chip. Subsequently, negotiations between the Wehrmacht and Elas failed last week, and commander of the 117th Jäger Division, Karl von Le Suir, ordered 300 men of the 737 and 749th regiments to carry out Operation Calavrita, which intends to destroy the strong enemy gangs in the area between Patras, Cleitora, Calavrita, and Elanoias. The villages from which shots will be fired will be set on fire and all men will be executed. On December 5th, Elas partisans learn that the Wehrmacht is approaching. They line up the German POW in front of an 80-meter-high cliff and shoot them dead. Seven survive the bullets and the fall, and news quickly reaches Le Suir, who orders the execution of the male population and the burning of the villages. On December 8th, the Germans pillage and burn the villages Rogoi, Kerpini, and Sakluru, killing 58, 37, and 21 men. Meanwhile, Elas evacuates his forces, leaving behind only civilians. On December 9th, the Germans still surround Calavrita. The inhabitants cooperate with the Germans as well as they can, but when on December 11th the Germans find more dead Wehrmacht bodies, they execute their 11 Greek guides on the spot. As this week ends, the fate of the civilians of Calavrita hangs in the balance. Meanwhile, in Italy, partisan resistance is uniting. When the Italian fascist state collapsed this summer, Italy exited the war and Germany invaded in September, the wide variety of ideologically opposed anti-fascist resistant networks and mainstream anti-fascist political parties joined under one banner. The National Liberation Committee, or Comitato di Liberazione Nazionale. It unites the parties on the left, the Communists, the Socialists, and the Labour Democratic Party, and on the right, the Liberals, the Catholic Action Party, and the Christian Democrats. Now, in December, they adopt the unifying title Partisans for their armed militants. The CNL is opposed to the Badoglio regime, allied with the United Nations, but are also receiving financial material and training support from the British and American Secret Services. By now, they control a force of around 10,000 partisans, a number that grows only slowly, as many veterans who would join if willing are lacking. On December 9th, German Führer Adolf Hitler receives a report at his East Prussia hideaway stating that 749,000 Italian soldiers are now interned in camps across the Reich and occupied territories. Close to 100,000 have joined the partisans in occupied Yugoslavia and Greece, where they were until recently themselves the occupiers, leaving fewer recruits left in Italy itself for the partisans. Nevertheless, their goal is to start an outright guerrilla war against the German occupiers and their Italian fascist puppets. But until now, they lack not only the numbers, but also the required coordination on a technical, structural, and ideological level. The units that came together mostly spontaneously after invasion were fairly small and uncoordinated, averaging barely a dozen fighters per unit. To alleviate some of those problems, the CNL is now organizing the partisans into squads of five to six, reporting to a detachment of around five squads that will be part of brigades with 100 to 300 fighters each. These brigades are being formed largely along political ideological lines, with party loyalty first and foremost, reflecting the reality of lack of unity inside the CNL, and exacerbating attempts to form a central command structure. Most of them operate in remote rural regions, especially the mountainous north, further increasing difficulty to maintain steady pressure on the occupiers who control the more accessible parts of the country. There are, however, already units forming in urban areas and cities around cells of the Resistenza, the secret opposition to fascist rule that began already in the 1920s. Out of their ranks, beyond the 10,000 armed partisans, there are tens of thousands of ordinary people, friends, often families, who come together into support networks around the squads, detachments, and brigades. In the Sousa Valley in Turin, one of these networks centers on the home of translator Ada Gobetti, her second husband, Ettore Marchesini, and Ada's 17-year-old son, Paolo, from her first marriage. Ada knows the dangers of opposition to fascism all too well. 
1925, two months before Paolo's birth, his father, her first husband Pietro, of a prominent anti-fascist publishing family, died of heart failure brought about by the lasting effect of wounds he sustained under arrest by the fascists a year earlier. Ever since, Ada has been relentless in opposing fascism in the Resistenza. Until the fall of Mussolini, her work focused on translating and disseminating forbidden foreign texts, publishing clandestine news and propaganda, and organizing political opposition with husband Ettore, a silent supporter. In 1942, Ada co-founded the Catholic Liberal Right Action Party, now part of the CNL. Since September, the whole family is working actively with the partisans, and Ada has begun keeping a diary written in deliberately convoluted cryptic English that only she can understand. Their home has become a safe haven for anti-fascists. The adults are helping coordinate various cells, the efforts to save allied soldiers, and Paolo is working as a scout and messenger. Ada never wavers in her conviction and dedication, but fear for her own life, those of her friends, her husbands and sons, permeate her diary notes. This week on December 7th, after Paolo returns home from a mission to bring intelligence briefs from Combascura to Turin, she writes, Every time Paolo returns, I feel what those who are condemned to death must feel when they are granted a stay of execution, an almost physical relief, and the desire to make the most of each hour and each minute. A relief that many in Italy will not be granted this week, especially Jewish, Italians, and foreigners inside the Nazi-controlled Salo Republic. Following the decrees from the past weeks, the arrests and deportations to murder by enslavement and gas pick up speed this week. In place after place, it follows the same pattern as in Venice, where Chief of Police Filippo Cordova has prepared lists and instructed his men. On December 5th, Cordova issues the order to begin the immediate arrest of elements belonging to the Jewish race. The following night, Italian police officers and fascist volunteers go door to door, lifting individuals and sometimes whole families from their beds. 163 Jews, 114 women and 49 men are arrested and transported to various prisons and jails. The next destination is transit camps. The main one is the Fossoli di Carpe POW camp near Modena, now repurposed as Italy's main concentration camp for people who are or are considered to be Jewish. It's operated by fascist police and volunteers, and within a week of its opening, more than a thousand men, women, and children are held there. The next step is transport onwards into the SS system of death and torment. Some never arrive in the intermediary camp, but go to Eastern Europe immediately, like in Milan, where on December 6th, the first of what will eventually be 12 transports departs from the central station for Auschwitz-Birkenau. The 600 people on board are from Milan itself and Verona. They arrive in Auschwitz at the end of this week. Out of those who have survived the harrowing journey, 96 are selected for enslavement. The rest, close to 500, are murdered in the gas chambers, bringing the immediate death toll of the transport to 504. That adds into the total Auschwitz murder rate of 1,571 men, women, and children, most of whom killed in the gas chambers. Among them are 334 wounded Soviet POW who arrived in the transport at the beginning of the week. In a belief-defying moment, the SS worry that the gassing of these prisoners of war makes them guilty of war crimes, and a rumor is deliberately spread that they have been transferred to another camp instead. At the subcamp Neudax, 26 inmates are murdered by hanging after being found guilty of trying to tunnel out of the camp. The hanging is executed in front of all the other inmates at the morning roll call. While the commandant of Auschwitz Monowitz, Heinrich Schwarz, reads the verdicts, some of the victims call Long Live Poland and encourage each other by calling out to the others to stay brave. After the tables that they are standing on are pulled away and they are slowly strangulated by the weight of their own bodies against the ropes, the other inmates are forced to march past the gallows and look intently at their dead and dying comrades. The corpses are left dangling for 24 hours as a warning against organized escape attempts. There are also murders outside of the gas chambers in the quarantine camp. 
The gas wounded Soviet POW were part of a bigger sick transport of 1200 from the Flossenburg concentration camp meant to go directly to the gas chambers. Now, 258 of the weakest died already on the train, while the rest were brought to the quarantine camp B2A at Auschwitz II Birkenau instead of the gas chambers. But the camp administration deemed that 80 of them are too weak to live, so they order them to be carried out to the lumber yard and put on the snowy ground there, out of which the other inmates are forced to pour cold water on the victims. In the night, when the guards are fewer, some of the inmates return and drag as many as they can back into the warmer barracks. They manage to save 47 of the 80 men and women from a certain death. Around a dozen of them will survive the war. This week, for more than four years, humanity has been cast into a wintry night. Four years when human lives have been snuffed out like were they part of a vast glowing forest of candles whipped by a whirlwind. A wind that has blown for more than 1,500 days of war and occupation, more than 900 days of genocide and countless days of human lives lost. Soon, we will celebrate Hanukkah and Christmas, both then and now. Today, in a time when the forces of darkness are again trying to extinguish the lights of freedom, the hope for peace, and the love of life, let us dedicate the candles we light this year to all of those who have stood and still stand bravely against tyranny. Let us remember the light they bring to humanity and all the lights that were not allowed to shine long enough. We owe them a debt of gratitude that can only be paid in loving memory and our promise to never forget. Mm -hmm.